Welcome to Frank Stajano Explains and the Formal Languages part of the Discrete Mathematics course at Cambridge. We've seen formal languages, we've seen finite automaton. If a formal language is accepted by a deterministic finite automaton, we call it a regular language. That's the definition. Now comes the interesting part. We're going to prove, prove a, th a theorem, Kleine's theorem, that basically says that regular expressions and finite automata are equivalent. For every regular expression, there is a finite automaton, and vice versa. This theorem, too, is made of two parts. Today, we're going to do the easier part, from regular expression to automaton. It's not terribly difficult, so you might like to try to derive it by yourself before continuing with the video, and I encourage you to do so. Whether you do or not, if you enjoy this, make sure to give this video a like. What we've been looking at uh, until now uh, are languages produced by inductive rules, languages recognized by um, finite automata, languages recognized by regular expressions. We have proved that various ways of defining a language by saying it's the set of string recognized by this automaton were equivalent for a different type of automata. The next thing we are going to examine is uh, the relation with the languages recognized by regular expression. And interestingly, we will see um, an equivalence between the regular expressions and the automata as well. So by definition, a language is regular if and only if it is uh, recognized by some DFA. By the theorem we just proved, this also means a language is regular if and only if it's recognized by an NFA or by an NFA epsilon, because all these things are equivalent in expressive power anyway. And the next thing we're going to work on is that uh, it is also uh, regular if and only if it is recognized by a regular expression. So uh, this theorem is about converting to and from uh, regular expressions on one side and DFAs on the other side. But actually, in uh, proving the theorem, we don't work with DFAs, we work with NFA epsilons just because it makes it easier to build the appropriate constructions. But since we've already just proved that NFA epsilons and DFAs are equivalent, then this doesn't make any difference. Uh, once again, there are two sides to the theorem. Uh, and in one case, you have to go from the regular expression to the automaton and in the other case, from the automaton to the regular expression. So let's first do the side that goes from the regular expression to the automaton, which is the more fun of the two. The other one is, is more uh, involved and boring. So what we do is we work uh, in converting regular expressions to automata. We say we work by induction on the size of the regular expression. If I can do it for regular expression up to this size, uh, then I can use them as building blocks for making bigger ones. And the size is defined as the number of vertices in the abstract syntax tree. So you can always think of the regular expressions as their abstract syntax, even though by now with our conventions on priority, we can also write out the concrete syntax and it is completely the same. So uh, we're going to use these ones as the axioms uh, and the base case for our induction and build a machine that recognizes each of these, a different machine for each. And then we are going to say for the uh, or or union regular expression, if I have, if I'm able to build a machine that recognizes R1 and I'm able to build a machine that recognizes R2, here's how to build the machine that recognizes the union of R1 and R2 and so on for these other ones. So before you peek ahead and look, what do you think would be a machine that recognized the symbol A? Well, it would, it, we are talking uh, about a machine that starts in some state. So that's your starting state. And if it recognizes, if it receives as the input symbol A, it goes into some state, which is an accepting state. So there you go, you've made a machine that recognizes the symbol A. And if you want to make one that recognizes symbol B, just change B as the label of the arrow. 
If you wanted to do the machine that recognized the empty string, well, when it gets nothing, it says yes. So that's accepting. And that's a machine that recognizes the empty string. That was easy. Uh, if you want a machine that doesn't recognize any um, input, then you're in the star state. Nothing's accepting. You don't have any errors. That's it. That's all done. So that was easy. If I now want to make a machine given two regular expressions uh, and their equivalent machines, R1 and R2, if I want to make a machine that recognizes the union of these two, so it will match if either R1 matches or R2 matches, then what would I do? I can imagine having two parallel uh, things going on. Uh, let's see. For the union, I will have a machine here that recognizes R1, which is going to have some kind of starting state, then a bunch of things that happen inside, and then it's going to have some accepting states. Um, it's going to have some accepting states somewhere at the end, which are going to have a double uh, circle like this. And that's the one recognizing R1. There's going to be another one recognizing R2. It's going to have some initial state, some bunch of things that happen and states and so on, and then some accepting states, conveniently placed on the right part of the diagram. And my machine that recognizes this or that is going to be something that starts in some starting state, has some convenient epsilon transitions to the start states of these two machines. And then uh, it could have an accepting state here with epsilon transitions from all these things. Or equivalently, we could declare all these things here as accepting states of my combined machine. So this new machine uh, expresses the alternation or union of R1 and R2. Uh, for the concatenation of the two uh, machines over here, what I do is a similar trick. These are all the accepting states. I just sequence them into each other. So from each of the accepting states, I have an epsilon transition into the start state of the next one. I start in some state here. I have an epsilon transition to the starting state of that. And then all the accepting state of this are accepting state for the final machine. Or if I prefer, I may send them all with epsilon transitions into the unique accepting state of my machine. So the epsilon transitions are a convenience for doing all these tricks of combining things together. Uh, and finally, uh, before parting for today, the star, which is maybe the coolest thing, The star means repeat zero or more times. So I would, um, if I have a machine that represents the regular expression R with its starting state and all its accepting states over here, what would I do? Now, the ones who are quick to the draw would loop back these accepting states onto this. And this would be a mistake. And I would like you to think why it would be a mistake. The correct thing to do is to make yourself a starting state and say, I can take my r zero times, so this is accepting. <coughs> or I can take it once and then go back, and then I'm going to accept. All well, epsilons over here. Or I, I can go around this loop as many times as I like, and I always get back to an, an accepting state, as in the original one. So why is it? not proper to make this one accepting and start here. That's for you to figure out. So uh, last time, we were looking at the first half of uh, Kleine's theorem. And I stopped after having done the last of these constructions, saying uh, you can't do just looping back. That would be 
the thing that's here on slide 74, I was redoing them on my own on another slide, but it's the same question that's asked on slide 74. Um, you're not allowed to loop back to the starting state. You must make yourself another state before entering the machine and loop back to that. Is there anyone who's figured out exactly why? Raise your hand if you have. One. Only one person figured it out. Well, the other ones would do well to have a look at that. That's the kind of uh, thing that might be worth a few marks in an exam question. All right, so let's uh, get on with stuff. We've, um, we've done the first part of the theorem, which said, um, basically, if I have a regular expression, here's how I build a finite automaton that recognizes the same strings as the regular expression. We have to do the reverse. So this is, this is what we've done last time. I, mean, uh, I was working. I was doing all my little sketches um, on slide 66, but they covered all the things that are done in the subsequent slides, 67, 68, 69, blah, 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 all the way to 74. 75 is this same, it is still covered by that, 76. So we now get to 77. 77 is an example of putting all this together. So if I have to um, generate a finite automaton for this regular expression, the abstract syntax for this regular expression is uh, within the brackets I have the union of A and B. So I have symbol A, symbol B, union, then star, and then this is concatenated with uh, symbol A. The machine that recognizes symbol A, the NFA that recognizes symbol A, looks like this. You get an A, and you go into an accepting state. So I have that for this part, and I have one for recognizing symbol B. For this part, and I have the union. The union of these two is obtained by taking the starting state, an epsilon transition to the starting states of these other things, and then considering the accepting state of the union machine as the union of the accepting states of these. Or alternatively, making them both go with epsilon transition to another state, but I'm not going to make this any messier than it needs to be. Then the star, the last thing we saw last time, was obtained by making a starting state and making it accepting because you could also execute it zero times. And otherwise, going with an epsilon transition to your machine to be starred and from its accepting states, which are no longer accepting, so I'm just going to make this thing not a double circle going from that to your new accepting state. And then we wanted to concatenate this with another instance of the machine that recognizes A, which should have an accepting state uh, here. And since it's the end of it, it will keep it. And so I should concatenate this machine, <coughs> its accepting state then goes to the new state of that and is no longer accepting. So this one is no longer accepting. So this, uh, aside from some topological rearrangement, is the same as what you have uh, down here, this blob, and then this thing hanging off over there. It may, may look slightly confusing at first that it goes to the left, uh, but, but it's the same, because in a, you can execute this thing zero times or arbitrarily many times. All right, so that's the easy part, the one that's fun to do. You just do little sketches. We also have to do uh, the other part. So, but first of all, we had these questions that were lingering on. 
And the first one, is there an algorithm which, given a string u and the regular expression r, computes whether or not u matches r? Now we can answer this in the affirmative by saying, yes, the algorithm is to take the regular expression, build uh, an NFA out of it with the constructor we just did, transform the NFA into a DFA using the constructor we did the previous time, then feeding DFA the string u, uh, and this will cause a deterministic transition at every symbol of u, and then checking if the final state I get into is an accepting state or not. If it is, then uh, u matches r. If it is not, then u does not match r. So this is uh, what we just said. Uh, and we note here that this is something that satisfies theoretical computer scientists, but does not quite satisfy the type of people who um, take the attitude we have taken in the algorithms course, where we say if it's exponential, then we consider it's infeasible, because this thing does include an exponential blow up in the transition from the NFA to the DFA. Uh, when you create the DFA, you uh, increase the number of states to uh, 2 to the n, where n was the number of states in the NFA. And so this exponential growth is unacceptable in practice. But it is theoretically possible. And in practice, there exist other constructions for building the DFA, which we are not studying in this course, but they exist, uh, and which cost less than exponential. So anyway, we have a method that works all the time for um, creating a match. And I reassure you that the ways for creating um, a DFA that corresponds to a given regular expression are sufficiently um, efficient that they are what is actually used uh, in practice in tools that, uh, in many tools that search regular expression. Not all of them use the strategy of building a DFA, uh, but some of the good ones do. Um, and uh, then the DFA runs very efficiently, much more efficiently than the ones that use other strategies that don't use the DFA. So building the DFA has a cost, but then running the DFA is very efficient. 